Okay. So now, as this presentation will focus heavily on the science of black women's health, it makes sense to start with a definition of science that is easy to understand. So here's my definition of science. Science is logic backed up by evidence. So to me, science is logic, which I think is just common sense. And then all you need to do is back up your common sense with proof. So in other words, if I was to ask you what's two plus two, what would you say? Ten. Ten. <laughs> yeah. But here's how it works. Because my definition is science is logic backed up by evidence, your logic, in other words, your common sense says ten. But then I'd say, cool, prove it. Put two things on one hand, put two things on the other hand, now count them out loud. Let me hear you get to ten. <laughs> and there's your evidence. So, if we all go by this definition of science, no one should be able to confuse us. Because if someone says two plus two equals ten, they have to prove it, yeah? So science to me is logic, common sense backed up by evidence. And when I start to use my own definition of science, because there's loads of definitions out there, but when I start to use my own, I start to realize that science is simple. Now I find this interesting because when I do go into the schools, I like to ask the children, what's your favorite subject? And none of them say science. None of them. And why is that? Well, they say science is confusing. Science is too hard to understand. But if you go by this definition, you'll start to realize that science is very simple. And the reason why I like to keep things very simple, because a wise man once said, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. That was arguably the greatest scientist of all time, Albert Einstein. So if he can keep it simple, why can't we? Now, I agree with this statement. If you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. I do agree with that, but I'll take it one step further. I think if the person can't explain it simply, they don't understand the subject well enough, or they do, they just don't want you to understand it. So they explain it to you in a complex way, in a confusing way, so you don't get it. It's either one of the two, yeah? So as we go through this presentation, I'm gonna try and keep things very super simple, because I think that science is simple, yeah? And again, I'm getting backed up by Albert Einstein that says you have to explain this in me. Because science to me is just, it's just two plus two, it's just common sense, just logic. Two plus two. Or, as another wise man once said, Boom! Two plus two is four, minus one, that's three, quick maths. Quick maths. That's what science is to me, just quick maths, yeah? So that's what we're going to be dealing with today, quick maths. Now, for the people who have come to a Hidden Science Academy event before, they know that I break down science quite simply, but I'm curious. Show of hands, who's never been to a Hidden Science Academy event before? Show of hands. Wow. Okay, for the people who have never been to a Hidden Science Academy event before, I've got one thing to say to you. You're gonna learn today. You're gonna learn today. You're gonna learn today. So what are you gonna learn today? This is what we're gonna go through today. I'm going to be talking about why black women are dying. Very serious subject. So we're going to get to the bottom of this right now. We're going to be, a lot of the speakers have been talking about hormonal imbalances. I'll touch on it because a lot of the speakers have touched on it already. We'll talk about inflammation. Henrietta Lacks. If you haven't heard of this woman before, her story will blow you away. Then we'll talk about stem cells plus much more. No typo. All right. Now let's get started. Now many people find science very confusing. Our children find science confusing, adults find science confusing. Now, I think that confusion, and this is just based off of my observation, I think that confusion always leads to conflict. Now, that conflict can be internal or external. So, for example, the children that don't like science, I'll be like, why don't you like science? Like, ah, oh, physics. Ah, oh, physics is too hard, it makes my head hurt. Confusion, and it leads to conflict. That conflict can be mental conflict, like your head hurting, oh, I don't get it, all these equations, I don't get it. And then that will lead to pain. It could be mental pain, spiritual pain, physical pain, psychological pain, social pain. It's going to lead to pain. So anytime you're confused about something, it's going to lead to internal and or external. So I, I like to use children as an analogy. Let's say a child, they've got a best friend at school, but that best friend does something that they're confused about. It might create conflict between those two children and then they might end up having a fight or not talking to each other, which will lead to pain. So confusion always leads to conflict, conflict leads to pain. So what do we need to have? We need to have total clarity on anything that we're discussing. 
because I have found through my own observations that clarity leads to harmony and harmony leads to peace. Back in ancient Kemet, they called that ma'at, peace, balance, justice, harmony, all right? Now, as I'm going through my lecture, because I like to keep things super simple, at times I will be asking you guys questions and I just want you to try and answer them as logically as possible and as honestly as possible. So, here's my first question. What's more important, the truth or your opinion? The truth. Hands up, the truth. And again, try to be truthful. <laughs> try to be honest. Hands up, your opinion. Couple people, okay. But the majority said the truth, okay. Next question. To solve any problem, should you focus on the cause of the problem or the effects? Cause. Hands up who says cause. Hands up who says effects. Okay. All right. So most people say the truth is more important than your opinion. So as I'm going through my lecture, I am just going to be hopefully telling you the truth. However, as I go through my lecture, I just want you to believe one thing. I just want you to believe one thing as I'm going through my lecture. And that is, don't believe a word I say. Because we've all got smartphones. They call these smartphones, I don't know why they call them smartphones, but what we should do if someone says something is make the smartphone smart. In other words, look up what that person's saying. So as I'm going through my lecture, I want you to believe one thing, and that is nothing. <laughs> don't believe a word I say. We all have smartphones, make your phone smart. In other words, I want you, as I'm going through my lecture, to be like, that's not true, and go on Google or wherever you want to search and search for it and try and find the truth, yeah? So, when it comes to the truth, it's based on research and evidence. Now, I'm going to show you uh, my opinion. It may not be the truth. I'm going to ask you whether or not it's true or false. Here's one of my opinions. The more you live in an abnormal environment, the more you'll start to think it's normal. Is that true or false? Okay, and here's another one of my opinions. Anything that is outside of your awareness is outside of your control. True or false? False, I heard more falses. Hands up, false. Okay, all right, interesting. All right, so let's see how aware you are. So why are we here? It's because of these statistics. The BBC came out with this. Giving birth is more dangerous if you're a black woman. I don't mind being the angry black woman if it means that I can leave that hospital alive. They're five times more likely to die in childbirth than white women in the UK. If we don't operate now, we will sign you off as dead by morning. Serena Williams and Beyonce, two of the most famous black women on the planet, have also had difficulties with their births. How many black women need to die? Hmm. So that's a very big pro problem. Now, before the BBC came out with this story, were we aware of this? Some of us. Yeah. OK, so the majority of us weren't aware that black women in the UK were five times more likely to die from complications with regards to childbirth and pregnancy. We wasn't aware of that. OK, so this is a big problem for a lot of black women in the UK. Five times. That's a staggering number. Yeah considering the small percentage that we make up in the UK. What is the percentage that black people make up in the UK? Anyone know? 3%, 2%. Someone said three, someone said two, someone said five. 3.3, okay. So we make up 3.3% of the UK, but yet black women are dying at five times the rate of any other woman. What is going on? What are the problems that we are going through? Here's some of the problems that black women are going through. So when I was three years old, old, I was pregnant. pregnant. It was my first child. Um, mm -hmm. I was living with my boyfriend, not a lot of money. Um, I had just transitioned careers. And I, um, you know, very excited, first baby, very scared. And I told myself, you know, I'm going to get the best care possible. I'm getting ready to go to Beverly Hills. I'm going to go to the best, you know, I'm going to go to the hospital where Beyonce and them go. Well, I don't think Beyonce had her baby at this time. <laughs> but where all the stars go and this is, I'm going to get the best care possible. Mm -hmm. So I went over there, I did that, and I immediately began to feel like othered. When I would go to the doctor, I felt myself being rushed out. I felt all my concerns about um, 
what was happening to me, which was like a lot of spotting, a lot of pain, and just something intuitively letting me know that something is not right with my pregnancy. I just, you know, watch myself be ignored in hindsight now that I know what I know working in this organization mm -hmm. and getting the experience that I have. So at six months, I went into a premature labor. I was hurting in the bathroom, the same pains I've been having the whole time, and hearing my doctor's voice saying, nothing's wrong, like, you're okay, this pain is fine. Mm -hmm. And then when I tried to go get back into the bed, my water broke. Um, we rushed to the hospital. I had to deliver the baby, but of course it was a stillborn baby, considered a stillborn even how early it was in my pregnancy, mm -hmm. six months. Be aware of this. In America, this was a clip that I got from America, uh, black women are twice as likely to deliver a stillborn baby than any other woman. Twice as likely. Why is this? And some people might say, well, that's America, isn't it? Come on, it's America. Well, again, I like to do a lot of research. And me researching this subject, I went on to the Office of National Statistics. Now, when it comes to UK statistics, they always get it from this place. Office of National Statistics. That's it. There's the source there. And I found this. Now... I'm not an expert on this, so I might need help on this. This says gestational age varies by ethnicity. In 2015, the greatest percentage of all live births, 62%, occurred in the white British group. The lowest percentages of all live births were babies from the Bangladeshi and Black Caribbean groups with 1.4 and 0.9 of all live births, respectively. And then here's the figure that shows it. Now, someone help me explain, or someone explain to me what I'm seeing here, because I'm confused. What am I seeing here? What is it telling me? What is it saying? Is it saying what I think it's saying? Because I, I'm seriously, I don't understand what I'm looking at. Are they saying that we're not even delivering live babies? In other words, this is stillborn. So when it comes to stillborn babies, Black African and Black Caribbean are the lowest. Is that what, am I reading this correctly? Someone say no? Am I reading this correctly? So black women are delivering dead babies, basically. If this, if this is true, anyone from the Caribbean here? <laughs> We're lucky to be here. This is crazy. We're lucky to be here if this is true. I couldn't believe it when I saw this. Look at what, look at this. What is happening, yeah? All right. This is UK, Office for National Statistics. This is England and Wales. Compare it to Africa and the Caribbean. That's it. So again, we've all got smartphones. That's something to research. Is this happening everywhere or just the UK? Yeah? But very important for us to understand if this is true, that's crazy. So black women are having problems during, child, uh, during pregnancy, during childbirth, and delivering stillborns. And sometimes the black woman is not even surviving the childbirthing experience. Sometimes we need to get some real stories. This is Kyra's story. I can really brag on my wife all day long. We're talking about a woman that spoke five languages, that raced cars, that was so compassionate, so loving. And we would always kind of joke that our life is like a movie. When we found out that we were welcoming another boy, we were just ec you know, ecstatic. Kira was exceptionally healthy. Every single prenatal visit that we went to, she got great reports, the baby was healthy. Hi, Daddy. Hey, Hi, 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 emotion or experience that you can compare to that, right? Being in the delivery room when your son is born with your wife and, you know, welcoming him into the world. It was an amazing, amazing feeling. Uh, here goes, you know, the, the next case, and then you can 
Shortly after Langston was born, they took us back to recovery. Kira's sitting there, and I first noticed that there was blood in the catheter um, at her bedside. And that was the first sign that I realized that something wasn't, wasn't quite right. I brought it to the attention of the nurses and the doctors. They ordered a CT scan that was supposed to be performed stat. Right, and so stat, in my mind, I'm thinking that means immediately. She's beginning to tremble uncontrollably. She's beginning to shake. She's beginning to be in increasingly more pain. There's still no CT scan. The doctor's walking next to the bed, and he says to me, I'm gonna fix it, and she'll be back in 15 minutes. She'll be back in 15 minutes. And that was the last time I saw Kira alive. And that's not a unique story. These are stories that are happening over and over again, not just in the US, but in the UK All as well. All the stories I heard were similar. Difficult pregnancies with none to minor previous health issues and responsive medical professionals that ignore the concerns of the mothers and lack of knowledge on the resources available to make the pregnancy and birthing process, process go smoother. smoother. NPR, NPR collected stories from 200 black mothers and found out that, quote, the feeling of being devalued and disrespected by medical providers was a constant theme. Contrary to the assumption, this issue does not only affect poor and uneducated black women. Recently, Serena Williams has been in the news for experiencing a very difficult birthing process. In interviews following her experience, she spoke about this issue that affects so many women in our community, regardless of class and access. The queen of the courts is revealing the dramatic story behind the birth of her daughter and life as a new mom. Williams saying she had to deliver baby Olympia by emergency C-section in September, saying the moment her new daughter was laid on her chest was an amazing feeling and then everything went bad. After feeling short of breath, a CT scan revealed that Williams had a pulmonary embolism and other blood clots, which set off coughing fits that burst her C-section incision. She then had to have additional surgery to correct and prevent more clots from forming. Serena was lucky enough to survive, but a countless number of black women were not. The reason why black women are losing their babies was, and this was very racist and we didn't learn it until now, we believe what we were being told, was that it was because we're drinking, we're smoking, we're not getting prenatal care, we're eating horribly. Some of those things are still true, but what the research is saying now is no, because vegan black women are having these problems. The PhD women losing their babies at higher rates than white women are being blind. All types of black women are having these problems. So what is the common variable here? And it's racism, it's discrimination. Right back to racism. Mm -hmm. And we don't, we felt ashamed to continue to use that word and almost blame it on that. But we can't run away from the truth if we want to save black babies and black mothers. Okay, so according to that black woman, she thinks it's race and she's living in America. So a lot of people would probably agree with her. However, we're in the UK. So what is it over here? Now, if we just say it's, you know, it's to do with race, that's not scientific now, is it? Because now you know my definition. Science is logic backed up by evidence. So you need evidence. So here's some evidence. Now this is from the government cabinet office, race disparity audit. Now they did this in 2017 and they revised it in February 2018. So this is the most up-to-date st uh, statistics around any race disparities that are going on in the UK. So summary findings from the Ethnicity Facts and Figures web website. So as I'm going through my lecture, I suggest that you guys take notes, obviously, take pictures of slides, and again, don't believe a word I say. We've all got smartphones. Make your phone smart. So you guys can look this stuff up. You can download the PDF and find out this information. But here's the summary from the race disparity audit. And there's the website there if you want to get it. It says, this is, the, the, this is what the um, 
the audit found. Mental disorders such as anxiety and depression, and remember this is the UK, are most prevalent among black women. Black men are 17 times more likely to be diagnosed with a serious mental health condition. Drug dependency is three times higher amongst black people than any other group. Black adults are least likely to receive any counseling or therapy for their mental health conditions. And childhood obesity, something that I teach when I go into the schools, is most prevalent in black African and black Caribbean children in the UK. So black people, we're sick in the UK, according to these statistics. It's got so bad that even on the NHS website, this is NHS choices, they've got a section just for us. Black health issues, and it says, again, this is from the NHS, if you're African or African Caribbean and you live in the UK, you're more likely than people from other cultures to have certain health conditions, including high blood pressure, diabetes, and prostate cancer. Now, after reading something like that, what would be the logical question to ask? Why? So, NHS asked the experts why to find out the truth, and here's what the experts had to say. Experts aren't sure why these conditions are more common in people of African and African Caribbean origin, but they think it may be linked to diet, lifestyle, and different ways of storing fat in the body. There are several ways to reduce your risk of these conditions. Find out how to protect yourself from, against diabetes, high blood pressure, and prostate cancer. In other words, we don't know the cause, but we can treat the effects. Don't know the cause, but we can treat the effects. So you ask the expert, Expert, what's going on with black people? You're the expert, can you tell us something? The expert says, I'm not sure. Well then you're not an expert then, are you? you. All right, now, when it comes to um, explaining science to people, I like to use analogies. So here's my analogy of this sort of stuff. Let me ask you a question. If you had a fish in a fishbowl and the fish was sick, what would be the logical thing to do? Would you treat the fish or would you change the water? Change the water. Logic would say you'd change the water because the fish is only going to be as healthy as the water it's swimming in. In other words, it's the environment, yeah? So you need to change the water. However, we live in a society that does what? Treats the fish. It doesn't look at the environment, yeah? Now, when it comes to the environment, which I, have, I use as an analogy, the water, in America, the state of the water is obvious. Because in the US, the rate of maternal mortality is three times higher for black women than it is for white. That's according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And in New York, the situation is even worse. The risk is eight times higher. <laughs> Black women of all backgrounds are affected, even those like Shamani, who are well educated and have good health care coverage. We say the root of the problem is racism. Racism was baked into the really the DNA of this country. And since then, every policy has reflected that history, including the myth that uh, black people don't experience pain like white people, which affects people who are going to give birth and are complaining of pain or may have a complication that is not taken as seriously because simply of the color of their skin. Last year, New York City launched an initiative to reduce maternal deaths among black women. Amongst the measures, more funding for certain hospitals and more training for medical staff to make sure they don't have racial prejudices. More training. I always find it funny when they think that the solution to racism is racial prejudice training. In other words, don't be a racist trainer. Like, you go up to the person, can you not be a racist? <laughs> no, I'm going to need training for that. <laughs> That's the society that they live in. Like, do you need some don't be a racist training? <laughs> yeah. That's what racial prejudice training is. Don't be a racist training. This is the society. But again, people will say, come on, that's America. Yeah? However, they said at the beginning of this video that in America, black women are three times more likely to die from complications during childbirth. What's the number over here? Five. Five. So over here, it's worse. I've not had one person. <laughs> that I can that be I like, can oh, they were lovely. lovely. I'm so glad I had them during my baby journey because they've all just been pretty rubbish.
more likely to have severe complications than white women. So it's clearly a really important area to, to focus on and work out why. The difficulty is that there's no one easy answer. It's actually a very complex picture. It's very complex. We're not, we're not sure why. So, in the UK, death in childbirth and pregnancy-related complications is rare. But yet, black women are dying at five times the rate. Hmm. Now, is it racism? Again, in America, this was something I like about America. They're, they're blatant. They're like, yeah, it's racism. We can do that. So what? <laughs> Over here, hmm, let's remind ourselves what happens when we start or try to start talking about racism. Let's remind ourselves of what happens to a woman of colour when she's on TV and she mentions the word racism. Okay, yes, you will next. Put your hand on the uh, The problem we've got with this is that Meghan has agreed to be Harry's wife and then the press have torn her to pieces. <laughs> and let's, let's be really clear about what this is. Let's call it by its name. It's racism. She's a black woman. And she has been it's torn not racism. to pieces. You can't she just... has been torn to pieces. It's not racism. It absolutely no, it's is. Not. We're the most tolerant, lovely country uh, uh, in Europe. Let's Says celebrate our women. It's not racism. Says it's so easy to throw the charge of racism at everybody, and it's really starting what to get boring. What worries me about though. your comment is you are a white, privileged male who has no oh, experience. Oh. I mean, can I just? I can't I... help what I am. I was born like this. It's an immutable so you, characteristic. So, so to call me a white privileged male is to be racist. You're being racist. You cannot dismiss. Okay, okay. I just, I just... <laughs> so, it's not racism. It's not racism. No, it's not racism. And if you say it's racism, you're being racist. That's how it works on me. That's what I love about America. Like, they're blatant. Like, what? It's racism. What are you going to do? It's racism. Over here, though, they like to play the I don't see game. Yeah. I don't know if you've noticed that, especially with this Meghan Markle stuff. They like to play the I don't see game. For the people who are not aware of the I don't see game, it's like a code that they like to use. Here's some examples of the I don't see game. Your premise is this is all driven by racism. Britain's basically a racist country and the media's been racist, to which I say, on behalf of the media, where is that racism? I haven't seen it. The reason why the racism experienced by Megan feels so personal and it deeply resonates with a lot of people is because it's symptomatic of the culture of racism in the United Kingdom. What, what, right. what examples do you have? Where is this racism that you keep talking about? The social media mm -hmm. discussion of Meghan Markle mm -hmm. is shamefully racist. And you don't but when you look it. at the newspapers, yeah. they're sensationalist, they're vulgar, I don't see racism there. I don't see racism there. I don't see racism there. Oh, cold, the I don't see game. They like to play it a lot over here. Yeah? It's the I don't see game and it works because it was Adolf, I think it was Adolf Hitler that said, make the lie big, make it simple and keep saying it and eventually people will believe it. Yeah? There you go. So if Adolf Hitler used that as propaganda, they're using it today. Just, just deny it, yeah? That's part of their code. So they like to play this I don't see game, which I find funny because every time someone says I don't see, and it's not just racism, some people say, oh, I don't see color and all this sort of stuff. Anytime I hear someone say that, it just makes me think of this. <laughs> because this is like the only way you wouldn't be able to see color or see racism, yeah? So this is the I don't see game. But here's the thing. If you don't see colour, you don't see racism, then you won't have any empathy for the people who experience it. My daughter was perfectly healthy. She was perfectly fine. Mentally and physically, she was perfectly fine. And she died in that hospital. More women are going to die. I mean, it's just that simple. If we don't get a handle on this and turn it around, then more women are going to die. Who was Dominique? First of all, she was my daughter. Dominique was a sister. She was a mom. Dominique was a beautiful, powerful black woman. She was a star that was zapped away from out of this world.
never woke up. And we didn't get a chance to see her. We didn't get a chance to tell her we love her. We didn't get a chance to do anything, to touch her, to do anything. I didn't see my daughter until she had passed and they brought her in the room for the family to come and view. Hey, baby. And I'm looking like, but all you people and my daughter died. I, I couldn't understand it. I couldn't understand it. This doctor told me life goes on. Well, my whole freaking life goes on. Yours is going on. My daughter's is not going on. You do not tell a parent that just lost her child. Life goes on. The fear is, without a real sense of urgency, many more American women will die before there's even a plan in place to address the problem. So without a real sense of urgency, nothing's gonna happen. And remember, this is America. But remember, over here they play the I don't see game. Now if you don't see injustice, you're not gonna have any empathy for the people who experience it. So the doctor told her, life goes on, yeah? No empathy. So the I don't see game leads to no empathy and no empathy leads to a lack of urgency on what to do about the situation. So think about it. I keep on trying to stress it. It's worse in the UK. So if you're seeing these clips, which I got from America, these are American women, it is worse over here. So why is it worse in the UK? When I found out I was pregnant with Elijah, I was like, that's it. The least interaction I have with hospitals and things, the better I know it will be for me. But um, I still had the hospital birth. Although I knew I didn't want it, I was still a bit nervous about the possibilities of having a baby at home. I didn't trust them at all. Nobody within the maternity field could convince me that they were that they had my best interest in heart. When, when we're thinking about why women die, um, there's, there's, sort of, there's two types of why. So there's, there's why in terms of did they have heart disease or did they have severe bleeding? Uh, but there's also a why in, in terms of was the treatment that we gave to these women, could we treat women better to prevent them dying? If there is any, exam any evidence that uh, she's not being listened to or if the system doesn't seem to be working for them. So it, it's, it's, it's going back and, and you know, making sure that we are focusing on those issues. When you start to talk about the way you felt you've been treated, the things that have happened to you, and you say, actually, you know, that was really hinky, that was, that was really racist, and people say, no, it's not racism, it's not black women, it's all women, this happens to all women. So you're shut down, you're silenced, and so you say nothing. Which is now being carried out to find out why the numbers of maternal deaths in black women are higher than white women. So the experts aren't sure why. The experts aren't sure why. But research is now being carried out. What's the number over here again? Five times. So when black women were two times more likely, no research. When black women were three times more likely, no research. When black women were four times more likely, no re in other words, no urgency. Because the no urgency comes from the lack of empathy. The lack of empathy comes from the I don't see game. I don't see it, yeah? But where's the urgency gonna come from? Because again, five times is a staggering number. Like, at what point are we gonna start arresting people for murder? Like, go up to hospitals and say, wait, let me see, how many black women have died at this hospital? What? I need some answers, yeah? <laughs> Kim. <laughs> Don't wanna watch the rest of it. <laughs> But think about if we were talking about something else, like it was a dental practice or something, and black women were going into the dentist for a root canal or to get a tooth removed and ending up dead in the dentist chair. At what point are we not going to go to the dentist and be like, hey, what well fam? <laughs> How come so many black women are dying on your, in the dentist chair? 
Answer me, I need answers. Oh, you're not sure? Arrest everyone. Arrest everyone on suspicion of murder. But there's no urgency over here. Black women are dying and there's no urgency. And why is there no urgency? Well, we're confused. We don't even realize this. I said at the beginning, and it was my opinion, anything that is outside of your awareness is outside of your control. How, how are we gonna control this stuff if we don't even know it's existing? How do, we didn't know before the BBC came out with this report about black women dying five times the rate of any other woman. So we're confused. So we need total clarity. And part of that confusion is I don't see. So they like to use that with us, but some of us might be doing that with our children. Like, no, don't see color. What do you mean don't see color? Children are very logical. They see color, they see size, they see shapes, they see numbers. You tell a, tell a child to not see color, it doesn't make sense. That's why when I go into the schools, I like to test the children. I'll be like, children, come here. What's that on the floor? What's that? And they'll be like, oh, that's a beautiful yellow flower. I'll be like, does everyone agree that it's yellow? Can everyone see that it's yellow? All right, what about that one there? And they'll be like, okay, that's a beautiful purple flower. Everyone agrees it's purple. Can everyone agree that the yellow and the purple flower are both beautiful? And they both live in the same environment in harmony. In other words, you can see the color and it not make a difference. You can still live in harmony with each other. So the I don't see color thing creates confusion, yeah? And confusion always leads to conflict and conflict leads to pain. And pain is not always physical. Pain can be mental, pain can be spiritual, pain can be emotional, it can be psychological. That's the reason why we need to start studying our health from a black perspective. Because contrary to popular belief, we are different. Now we're similar, but we are different. We have different skin tones. The people that have booked onto the course, you're gonna learn about you melanin. That's what you have. It's black and brown. Other people have a type of melanin called pheomelanin. It comes in red and yellow. Two different colors, but we're not saying one's better than the other, but they're different, yeah? So that's when you'll learn about yourself from a black perspective. Your color is different. Your skin is different. Your, it doesn't matter. You, the people that say I don't see color, what happens if you do? You're gonna kill me? Because if that's the point, then obviously you might need some racial prejudice training then. <laughs> so with the Black Holistic Health course, you'll learn that we are different, but there's nothing wrong with being different. A yellow flower is beautiful. A purple flower is beautiful. They're different. There's nothing wrong with being different. And some people will say, well, underneath the skin, we're all red, we all bleed the same blood. Well, even that's not true. According to who? Leon Marshall? No, according to science. We have different blood types, yeah? So I'm not an expert on blood, but just briefly, there's four main blood categories. A o, A, B, and AB. But each one can be split up into positive or negative. So you can be O negative, O positive, A negative, A positive, blah, blah, blah. Now what's the difference? Well, through doing my own research, it seems that the, the positive ones have this RH thing in the blood, yeah? So O positive RH, A positive RH, B positive RH, yeah? So the only difference between positive and negative is this RH thing that's present. Now, look, look at this. O negative can be a donor to all the other blood types. Did we know this? O negative can be a donor to all the other blood types. No other blood type can do that, yeah? Now, I've heard a lot of people, again, I'm not an expert, I've heard a lot of people explain the different blood types, but no one, in my opinion, has broken down in a simplified way the different types of blood other than this guy called Minister Inky. So listen to the way he breaks down the different blood types. It's very simple, okay? There are two, when you look at the blood types, okay, there's four basic blood types, but the four basic oh, blood that, types have two categories. You have RH negative and you have RH positive. Okay, now when you're dealing with RH, first let's deal with the four blood types, O, B, A, B, and A. When you're dealing with B, A, and A, B blood types, you're dealing with antigens or fungus that have attached themselves to the blood and are now passed on genetically through the parents. Okay, the O blood type is the original blood type and that's why the O blood type can be a donor to any other blood type However, it cannot receive blood from any other blood types because those blood types will infect it, okay? Interesting. So O means original. The O blood type is the original blood type. 
Now, if this is true, the next logical question then would be, well, who's got the old blood type? Well, who's the original people of the planet? Yes, well, according to the evidence, it's you, black bro, woman. Bro, 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 bro. Yeah. So this was this was from Daily Mail. So mainstream media run with this story. Yeah, this was from the Daily Mail, and this story says, "Is this the mother of us all?" And it says, "How science has proved that there really was an Eve." Just imagine this: you, me, and every man, woman, and child who walks the earth is descended from the same African woman. And then they go into the science, which is what to do with mitochondrial DNA and that sort of stuff, and your blood type, the original. So according to the Daily Mail, black women, you are the original human beings of this planet. <laughs> now, this was from the Daily Mail, and I got this from my black history teacher, Robin Walker, shout out to Robin Walker. <laughs> My black history teacher, Robin Walker, he taught this on one of his history courses and he was like, you won't even find this on the internet anymore, yeah? So, when he showed it to us, he said, yeah, when I saw this, when I read it, because it was in 1995 that they came out with this story. Daily Mail, Thursday, May 11th, 1995. He said he took a picture of it because they will remove it from the internet. Guess what? I've been trying to search for it. Can't find it on the internet. Yeah, so big up Robin Walker for making sure that he documented it. Yeah, this is them admitting who the original woman of the planet is. Yeah, so Robin Walker was like, nah, I have to capture that. And he teaches this on his course. So this is very, very important information. But now they've wiped it off the internet. Why would they wipe it off the internet? <laughs> Let's ask the experts. Experts, why would you wipe it off the internet? We're not sure. <laughs> So, going back to the blood, black women, you have the original, or you should have the original blood type, which is O, yeah? But going back to what Minister Inky said, there's different types. So you can be O negative or O positive, and it depends on this RH gene. So, back to Minister Inky, what is this RH gene all about? The reason why it's called RH negative, or your RH type, or RH positive, is because the RH stands for rhesus monkey. Okay, the rhesus monkey is where the Europeans have their lineage from. Okay, they stem from the rhesus monkey. Okay, African people do not. Our origins. Hold on a second. Wait a minute. Wait, hold on. Okay. What did you just say? Wait, hold on. 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 Wait, We've all got smartphones, make your phone smart, yeah? Well, I have to take my own advice as well. So I, shout out to Minister Inky, by the way. I rate Minister Inky, I watch a lot of his videos. I suggest you do too, yeah? But I don't believe any, a word anyone says, whether it's Minister Inky, Dr. Leel Africa, or Dr. Sebi, because to me, science is simple. It's logic backed up by evidence. So I don't believe a word anyone says. I want proof. I want to do my own research. So when he said this, I was like, Pfft. Let me do my own research, because that sounds crazy. And my research brought me back to the NHS. So let's see what the NHS says with regards to blood groups, yeah? So NHS says there are four main blood groups, types of blood, A, B, A, B, and O. I find it interesting that you put O at the end, even though O's the most important blood type, but just an observation. Yeah? Your blood group is determined by the genes you inherit from your parents, we know this. Each group can be either, either RHD positive or RHD negative, which means in total there are eight main blood groups. So that's agreeing with what Minister Inky said. Then they go on to say, in most cases, O RHD negative blood, O minus, can safely be given to anyone. It's often used in medical emergencies when the blood type isn't immediately known. It's safe for most recipients because it doesn't have any of the A, B, RHD antigens and it's compatible with all the other blood groups. Then it goes on to say, the NHS Blood Tra and Transport website has more information about the RH system. So I wanted to find out, what's this RH system? So I click on it and it says this. Red blood cells sometimes have another antigen. Now they call it antigen. Minister Inky said it's a fungus, yeah? <laughs> they call it an antigen, yeah? A protein known as RHD antigen, yeah? If this is present, your blood group is RHD positive. In other words, you have the rhesus antigen, yeah? The rhesus 
Funkless. Rhesus genes. Positive. If it's absent, your blood group is RHD negative, and then they go through the positives and negatives and blah, blah, blah. But then it says here at the end, about 85% of the UK population is RHD positive. RHD positive? Hold on a second. What percentage of the UK do black people make up? <laughs> what percentage? 3%. So wait a minute. Is the NHS trying to say that white people come from? one of two ways it could have got there. Yeah? Only one of two ways. Either somewhere in my family history, one of my ancestors got held down and injected with rabbit blood, or, or somewhere in my family history, one of my ancestors was added like rabbits with rabbits. There's only one or two ways I can stand here in front of you and have rabbit genes in my blood. So therefore, if white people have monkey genes... Where is that? I don't know what Let me just now it. No, frigate. Hold on. So if you lot are monkeys, yeah? Yes. If you lot are monkeys, yes. why do you keep calling us monkeys? Like, what sort of reverse psychology they is that? Can, Every time we're on the football pitch playing football, all you hear is, Oi! Monkey! And then they throw something. What do they throw in the football? Pitch? The banana skin. Yeah, not the banana. Because, you know, monkeys have to... <laughs> Science is simple. <laughs> All you see is banana skins on the pitch. <laughs> this is why you need to understand your 
pointing from a black perspective. Yeah? Because we're different, but there's nothing wrong with being different. That was Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin is a big, big biologist. You know what I'm saying? They put this in our science books. This is what they teach our children. They teach our children that foolishness. Yeah? But again, so what? I don't know. I don't know. Like the experts, I'm not sure. But, I don't know. But whether it's true or not, who cares? Like I say, it, it doesn't matter. Okay, you, 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 where you come from? Monkey? Okay, cool. Don't matter. We can still live in harmony in the same environment. Doesn't matter. But we need to understand our health from a black perspective. So, big up the people that have already booked onto the course. Big up the people that have done the course. I see some of my ex-students in here. So, big up. Yeah. Now, for the people who haven't done the course or are thinking about doing the course, I'm just going to give you a little taster on the sort of classes that we do. So I'm going to give you a quick class on hormones. Now, some of the other speakers have spoken about hormones, so you should be familiar with this stuff. But I'm going to go through the science behind hormones. So this is the science behind hormones. So what is a hormone? Hormones are chemical messengers that give the cells instructions. So um, Claudine, who's left now, she talked about this earlier. But just to hammer it home, they give your cells instructions. Your body is made up of trillions and trillions of cells. So you've got muscle cells, you've got nerve cells, you've got brain cells, pancreas cells, bone cells, heart cells. Each one of those cells needs instructions. The cell needs to do something in your body, but it needs instructions. So hormones give your cells instructions. They tell the cells what to do. So I like to use analogies when I'm explaining um, science. It's like you being at your office and it's a new job and you need your boss to tell you what to do. So you being at your office, you're like a cell. The people in the office, they're cells and they're waiting for instructions from the hormone, which is their boss. The hormone comes, they might just give them their instructions like this. Okay, here's what you're doing today. Here's your instructions. Then the cells gather around. Okay, gather around cells. Here's our instructions. This is what we're doing today. And then they read their instructions and then go and do what they're supposed to be doing. Yeah, that's what horm hormones do. They give the cells instructions. Now, another analogy, especially pertaining to what we're talking about today, is like a mother and her children. If you've got really young children, you have to give them instructions every day. So you're acting as a hormone to your children who are the cells. You have to give them instructions on how to behave, what to do, yeah? So that's what hormones do. They go around, they're released by glands, they're secreted from uh, glands of the endocrine system. Hormones released in the brain are called neurotransmitters. They are electrical messengers that give the brain cells instructions. Now the glands, I'm sure you're familiar with some of them, you might not be familiar with all of them. You've got your pituitary gland that's in your brain. Then you've got your thyroid gland and your parathyroid gland that's in your, in your neck. Thyroid gland controls your metabolism, parathyroid that controls your calcium levels, so they're gonna secrete um, hormones that are gonna tell your cells instructions on metabolism and calcium. Adrenal glands, what is the adrenal glands release? Adrenaline, adrenaline when it's released, it gives your cells instructions on to speed up and be in a heightened state of awareness and that sort of stuff. The adrenal glands also release cortisol though, cortisol, which is a stress hormone, yeah? So when you're under stress, cortisol is getting released. Pancreas, anyone know what a pancreas release is? Insulin, so insulin is a hormone that gives your cells instructions to open up for glucose. That's the instruction that insulin gives your cells. Okay, glucose is coming in, open up, yeah? And then your ovaries and testes, your estrogen and your testosterone. Now, this is in your body. Even just in your brain, look how many hormones, neurotransmitters get released in the brain, yeah? So these are all instructions. Now, here's the thing when it comes to your body. The, the body can't release all of these hormones at the same time because that would just be too many instructions for the cells. That would be confusion, yeah? That's like being at work and line manager's telling you one thing and next line manager's telling you another and you're like, oh, what am I supposed to do? Too many instructions. So the body releases these at different times of the day, yeah? All of these hormones. Now, again, you might not be familiar with all of them, but you should be familiar with some of them. Oxytocin. When is that released? Midnight. Breastfeeding, yeah. And when you give birth, yes. They, they call this the love hormone. This is what connects you to your baby. If you have a C-section, they might give you synthetic oxytocin so you don't hate your baby. <laughs> Seriously. They might have to give you, they might have to inject you with oxytocin because that's, that's supposed to be released naturally for you to have a bond with your baby. Yeah? So that's oxytocin. Prolactin. Sure you all know what prolactin is. Again, for breastfeeding, that's 
that's going to produce more uh, breast milk for the baby. And people that do my course, you know about this one, melanocytes stimulating hormone, that's going to stimulate your melanocytes to produce melanin. So these are all going to give yourselves instructions. Very, very important instructions. Now when it comes to these hormones, like, like prolactin and oxytocin, they get released through breastfeeding. So guess what? This becomes the first time you, black woman, give your baby instructions. This is you giving your baby instructions before you even open up your mouth to them. This is instructions. That's what's in the, the milk. That's what's in the milk. Instructions you're giving. And again, we went through prolactin, that's a hormone. And oxytocin, that's a hormone as well. But however, if a black woman is under a lot of stress, what gets released? Cortisol. So guess what you'll be feeding your baby if you are under stress? Cortisol. Yeah? And then that might affect them in later life. They might be, start suffering from anxiety and depression and all this sort of stuff, not knowing where it's coming from. This is how you give your baby instructions before you even open up their mouth. Yeah? Through milk. Breast milk. Human breast milk. Because milk is instructions. Therefore, if you're drinking anything other than human breast milk, what sort of instructions are you getting? So if you're giving your baby anything other than human breast milk, what sort of instructions are you giving your baby? Like, think about it. Cow's milk is cow instructions. So, you're giving your human baby, your human baby cells, cow instructions. That's not, think about it, that's going to create a lot of confusion. Like, again, going back to my analogy. Your baby cells are like, okay, what are we doing today? I don't know, we're just going to wait for our instructions. Oh, here they come, here come the instructions, okay. Here comes the instructions, gather around cells, gather around. Okay, read the instructions, what are we supposed to be doing today? Uh, <laughs> looks like it's in a different language. <laughs> Can't quite read it. Try, just try and read it. Okay, I think it says, eat grass all day, and I'm not getting it. I don't understand it, yeah? Now, anything that creates confusion leads to conflict, and anything that creates conflict leads to pain. Pain inside of your body is inflammation, yeah? Inflammation, so this could cause inflammation just because it's confusing instructions. That means all of this stuff is confusing instructions as well, because they come from the same place. So this is confusing, yeah? All right, neurotransmitters in the brain. Again, you might not be familiar with all of them, but you should be familiar with dopamine, pleasure neurotransmitter, serotonin, mood, mood neurotransmitter, and adrenaline, fight or flight neurotransmitter. Let's take a closer look at adrenaline. So it says, produced in stressful or exciting situations, adrenaline, increases heart rate and blood flow, leading to a physical boost and heightened awareness. Now, according to Minister Inky, he says that black people suffer from chronic flight, fight or flight syndrome. In other words, we're chronically releasing adrenaline. We're always releasing adrenaline, so we're always in a stressful or heightened state. Why is this? In America, they're starting to call it, well, some professors are starting to call it toxic stress. And it has an effect on your birthing. Statistics are stunning. Black infants are more than twice as likely to die than white infants. A racial disparity that's wider today than in 1850, 15 years before the end of slavery. And black women are three to four times as likely to die from pregnancy-related causes than white women. For a closer look at what's behind those numbers, we turn now to Linda Villarosa. Her in-depth report on the subject ran in the New York Times Magazine. Help us understand these numbers. What is going on in America, in the lives of black women, in our medical communities, that's causing this? Well, what I found in my reporting were really two things, both related to race. The first was that simply the experience of living in America as a black woman does something to your body that causes low birth rate babies, that causes maternal mortality, that causes infant mortality. Second is that there is a kind of racism in the healthcare system, and most of it unconscious. It's, it's a kind of bias that's existed for a long time. Um, the birth experiences of black women in America.
And you used a couple of phrases in your report I'd love for you to explain, toxic stress and weathering. How, how do those work in the context of this conversation? So when you hear the word stress, you kind of think of, oh, I feel really stressed out or I just need to kind of take a chill pill or relax. But really, toxic stress is the result of aggressions that happen to you and insults that happen to you. And in this case, race related, um, it, it can be everything from, I feel that I'm treated differently, people think I'm less intelligent, to I am being um, discriminated against by the police in housing and in my workplace. And those actually, it's been proven that those have a physical effect on the body. Because every time you get stressed out in this way, and if it happens repeatedly, all of your systems fire up. And if your systems continually fire up, they break down. And weathering is the idea that you, your bot, because of these um, repeated insults and this repeated firing up the system, the the body ages prematurely. And so, and it's not on the outside. I mean, it could be, but it's on the inside. And that all comes to a head during what is essentially a stress test of a woman's body, and that is pregnancy and childbirth. All right, so I hope people are starting to put two and two together now as to why you know, the problems are happening in the UK as well. So let's go back to hormones. So there are different types of hormones. Although there are many different hormones in the human body, they can be divided into three classes based on their chemical structure. You can have lipid-derived hormones. What does lipid mean? Fat, so derived from fat. Amino acid-derived hormones, like protein and then peptide hormones. They go on to say, let's talk about lipid-derived hormones. So this is derived from fat. Most lipid hormones are derived from cholesterol. Did we know this? Most lipid hormones are derived from cholesterol, so they are structurally similar to it. The primary class of lipid hormones in humans is the steroid hormones, ketones and alcohols. Now, their chemical names will end in OL, as in cortisol, or IOL, yeah, for the alcohols, or it might end in O-N-E. So you'll know something is a hormone by the way it ends. So if it ends in OL or IOL or O-N-E, it's a lipid-derived hormone. Now, why are lipid-derived hormones so important? Well, they're derived from cholesterol and they're steroid hormones. Now, steroid hormones are hormones that help to build up your body, yeah? They help to build up your body. That's the reason why they took steroids or steroid hormones and made drugs out of them. That's what steroids are. So if a, a male wants to take steroids, they're taking it to build themselves up. That's what your hormones in your body do, steroid hormones. Now, cholesterol becomes the star of the show because once you start to understand science, you'll realize cholesterol is the precursor to pregnenolone. Pregnenolone is the precursor to progesterone. And progesterone is the precursor to your steroid hormones, which is estrogen, adrenaline, and testosterone. Yeah? Now, why is this important? Well, they say in the UK that black people have high cholesterol levels. Mm -hmm. So when we have high cholesterol levels and we go to the doctors, the doctors say what to us? Take a statin drug, yeah? Statin drugs are designed to block cholesterol. But if you take a medication that blocks this, what happens down here? Hormonal imbalance. So that means if you're on a statin drug, yeah, it might be blocking the high cholesterol, but you'll have a hormonal imbalance. There's no way you can't, because it's blocking the thing that these hormones need, yeah? And not only that, not only is it the precursor to estrogen, adrenaline, and testosterone, Cholesterol is the precursor to vitamin D. So, the cholesterol in our skin, when your, sun is, when your skin is exposed to the sun, in particular UVB rays, ultraviolet B rays, the cholesterol gets converted to a, a precursor of vitamin D that has to go through your liver and kidneys, and then your kidneys produce the active form of vitamin D. So that means, when it comes to your hormones, especially the hormones that help to build you up, Cholesterol's the star of the show. But again, if we don't know this, remember anything that's outside of your awareness is outside of your control. If you don't know this, when you go to the doctors and they put you on a statin drug, it blocks the star of the show. It's gonna block the star of the show. That means hormonal imbalance here, stress levels here, for men, hormonal imbalance here, and for all of us, no vitamin D. No vitamin D. That's how important cholesterol is. To the point where if they really knew us as black people, you know, the experts who are always not sure, if, you, if we went to them and said, hey, we've got high cholesterol, if they really knew us, they should, they should say to us, go on holiday. 
Make sure you get out in the sun, and all of that high cholesterol will get converted into vitamin D. But they're not sure. All right, amino acid derived hormones. The amino acid derived hormones are relatively small molecules derived from amino acids, tyrosine, and tryptophan. If a hormone is an amino acid derived hormone, its chemical name will end in IME or IN, like adrenaline. So now you're starting to um, use language and know when you're looking at a hormone, yeah? And hormones give yourselves instructions. That's what hormones do, they give yourselves instructions. So these are two amino acid derived hormones, serotonin, look at the ending, IN, and melatonin, so you know they're hormones. These regulate the circadian rhythm, which is your internal bodily clock, to maintain a sense of balance, homeostasis within the body. So, serotonin and melatonin. Now again, I teach this to children. So, one is released during the day and one is released during the night. Which one's which? <laughs> melatonin at night. And the way I explain it to the children is melatonin makes you feel mellow. So they'll always remember that now. Melatonin gets released at night, serotonin gets released during the day. And it all affects your circadian rhythm, which is your internal biological clock. In other words, how did we survive without these? Because these tell us the time. Well, we have a natural, internal, biological clock that used to tell us what time it is, tell the body what time to release what hormones and that sort of stuff. But we don't go by our natural bodily clock anymore. Yeah? And the easiest way to go by this is to go by the sun. When the sun's up, you should be up. When the sun's down, you should be down. Literally, that will keep your hormones in balance. If you don't believe me, ask anyone who, who has worked night shifts for more than 10 years. Yeah. Ask them about their health. You can't cheat this stuff. When the sun's up, you should be up. And not just up, you should be out there absorbing it. So you shouldn't be in the office when the sun's up. And then when the sun goes down, you should go down. Yeah? And serotonin gets released during the day, so high alertness, best coordination, all that sort of stuff. So all of these hormones get released at certain times to ensure that you're a healthy person. Now, if they get released at different times, the times that are not supposed to be getting released, then you'll become unhealthy because you'll have a hormonal imbalance. Now, we just rely on our internal hormones and the sun will be okay, but we don't, do we? In the UK, we rely on medication. So, most common cholesterol medication in the UK, and look at the way they're ending in, because they're statin drugs, so these are hormones then. These are hormones, but they're not hormones inside of your body. These are external hormones. So these are drugs that they've created to mimic your hormones. You know they're a hormone because they're ending in IN. If it ends in OL or IN, you know it's a hormone. So all of these things are going to be giving your cells instructions instead of your body giving your cells instructions. Again, that's going to lead to total confusion. Again, going by my analogy, you're at work and someone you don't know is trying to give you orders. Not your line manager, not your boss. Someone comes up to you and says, hey, do this, here's your instructions. Do this right now. You're gonna look at that person like, you're not my line manager. I ain't doing that. That's not in my job description. Yeah? So medication is gonna cause total confusion in your body. Now, a lot of us are on medication. This was um, the top 20 drugs dished out most on prescriptions across England and in 2017. Tells you what the drug name is, you might be familiar with some of them, and what it treats, and then how much they sold. Look what they're ending in. I N. I-N-E, O-L, O-L. So these are hormones there, or they've synthetically made hormones to mimic what your body does, but it wants to give your cells different instructions. So all of this is giving your cells different instructions, yeah? Look at this, metformin. A lot of us are familiar with that because of type 2 diabetes. So that's giving your cells some different instructions, yeah? And all of those instructions are going to create an imbalance here. An imbalance here. A hormonal imbalance, yeah? Now, how would you know that everything's on time with this? Because this is your internal biological clock, where there's a couple reasons, well, there's a couple things you can do. Obviously, when the sun's up, you're up. When the sun's down, you're down. That's one way of getting more in balance with the universe, getting more in balance with the sun and that sort of stuff. But some other things you should know. So, it says here, in the morning, you should, you should have high testosterone levels. So the body, your testes, releases testosterone early in the morning. Now, every guy in here knew this when they were younger. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because you used to wake up saluting. So you know that this is true. You're supposed to wake up with high testosterone levels, yeah? How would you know you have an imbalance then? 
when you're not. <laughs> That's a hormonal imbalance. We think that hormonal imbalances are just for women. Nah, men have it as well. But the one thing that messes up our circadian rhythm, out of all of it, is this, the blue light. So, blue light from our laptops, blue lights from our phones, this synthetic light, because this is not sunlight, it's synthetic light, but it's so powerful, the body thinks it's 12 noon when you're on the laptop at night. Because look, the body's supposed to release melatonin roughly around 9 p.m. But what are we doing at 9 p.m.? We're doing this, yeah? We're on our phones, we're on our laptops, and again, the body's gonna think it's 12 noon, so it's gonna release 12 noon hormones. So you're gonna struggle to get to sleep. That's gonna cause confusion, yeah? So, and we're not only doing this, you know, we're supposed to be, you know, releasing melatonin at nine o'clock or trying to get to bed before 12, but black people, it makes me ask this question, like, are black people the new vampires? <laughs> because uh, let's, let's explore this. What do vampires do? Well, they, they wear shades during the day. <laughs> <laughs> they can't take the sun. I've heard black people talking about, oh, it's too hot. It's too hot. A couple of years ago, we had a long summer. I heard black people say, oh, no, it's too hot. Uh, that's a vampire. That is a vampire. And hold on a second. What else do vampires do? Vampires stay indoors during the day and go out at night. We're turning into vampires. And especially our young children, even when the sun is out, the sun is out, what do our young children do? No man, man's not hot, they're still dressed like this. <laughs> children are still out, sun blazing, man's not hot, you get me? But it's, it's funny, but it's tragic at the same time because their skin needs to be exposed for them to create vitamin D. Because this is the only way your body creates vitamin D. Your skin being exposed to sunlight and then cholesterol in your skin gets converted into the precursor of vitamin D, which goes through your liver and kidneys, and then your kidneys produce the vitamin D that your body needs. Now, vitamin D is so powerful. It literally protects us from everything, yeah? To the point where I've started to tell children that the D stands for defense. It defends us against pretty much every disease out there, yeah? To the point where, now I'm going out on a limb here because this is, not backed up by evidence, this is not backed up by the experts, but I'd go on a limb and say, for black people, vitamin D is your immune system. That is your immune system. So it's not white blood cells, it's vitamin D. If you lack vitamin D, you, your, your defense system is down. You're gonna suffer from any disease that's out there. But if your vitamin D is high, that is your defense system, yeah? because I've done so much research on vitamin D, I'm like, wow, this vitamin is amazing. It does so many things, to the point where I started to ask the logical question, is vitamin D really a vitamin? If you type vitamin D into Google, it will say this, vitamin D is a group of fat-soluble seco steroids. You now know steroids are hormones. So vitamin D is a hormone. Hmm, I did more research on it, and I found this guy. His name is Professor Walter Stumpf. So you can do your own research. Professor Walter Stump from the University of North Carolina. Now in 20, 2012, he wrote a paper and published it, a scientific paper about vitamin D. And in the paper, he reports that vitamin D is a hormone of, the re of reproduction and fertility. That means if you are lacking vitamin D, you're gonna have problems in reproduction and fertility. He says it's a hormone of growth and development. He says it's a hormone of immune and stress response. So if you're lacking in vitamin D, you're gonna have issues with stress and immunity. He says it's a hormone of the digestive system. So if you're lacking in vitamin D, guess what you're gonna have problems with? Digestion. He says it's a hormone of the central nervous system. And he also says it's a hormone of endocrine regulation. Now this one is powerful because the endocrine system is the system that releases hormones. So if vitamin D is the hormone of endocrine regulation, it regulates all your other hormones. So that means that vitamin D becomes the most important hormone for your body because it regulates all the others. They all rely on vitamin D. So for me, vitamin D is your immune system. It's not white blood cells. Water stump. Stump. S-T-U-M-P-F.
water stump. So this is what vitamin D does. Again, they're not telling us this stuff. And for those who think, oh, let me take um, vitamin D supplements then because you know, we're not gonna get any sunlight over here. Well, look at this. This shows you, this is from Dr. John Cannell from the Vitamin D Council. Where can you get vitamin D from? UVB exposure. Look how many units you get compared to what they tell us to get vitamin D from, which is fortified foods and supplements. Hardly any vitamin D, hardly any, but UVB exposure, lots, yeah? So that's, there's only one way, until they can put the sun in a, a capsule and sell that to us, there's only one way you can get vitamin D, and that's with your skin exposed to the sun, your, your skin absorbing it, and it converting cholesterol into vitamin D. So it's UVB radiation, hits your skin, your skin has to be exposed to the sun, and then it converts the cholesterol into a precursor that goes through your liver and kidneys, and then your kidneys produce the active form of vitamin D. So again, to, if you wanna quote someone, you can quote me. Leo Marshall says that this is our immune system, vitamin D, active vitamin D is our immune system. You got that working and everything's fine. It's gonna protect you from a lot of diseases. Now, that means that your liver and kidneys become very important to your health, because they're the ones that are involved in vitamin D synthesis. Now, what's interesting is a healthy liver and kidneys looks like this, yeah? Because your kidneys are connected to your bladder and then your prostate and your urethra. But unhealthy, there'll be a buildup of toxins. And guess where that buildup of toxins goes? Hmm. So for men, your liver and kidneys being unhealthy might lead to a, an enlarged prostate. And this is due to lack of vitamin D because these two organs are the ones that synthesize vitamin D. So if, you're, if you've got an unhealthy liver from drinking or whatever, or, and then unhealthy kidneys, it might lead to uh, prostate cancer. So this is what we need to understand about ourselves. Black men in the UK are three times more likely to die from prostate cancer or to develop it. Why? Lack of vitamin D. All right, let's talk about inflammation because anything that's confusing in the body will lead to conflict and conflict leads to pain. Pain in your body is inflammation. Now we've all heard about inflammation, but I think that sometimes visuals work better. So this is what inflammation is. Inflammation is the first response to any damage um, that your body receives, whether it's external or internal. So the damage here is like a, a pin going through your skin and there might be bacteria from that damage. And anytime some, something foreign enters your body, these chemical alarm signals get um, let off and then white blood cells come and eat the bacteria or kill the bacteria or kill the infection, yeah? So inflammation is something that your body has to do because that's the only way that you heal from something, yeah? So something happens, you're damaged, then the chemical alarm signals get sent out, the white blood cells come, which they usually say is our immune system, but the white blood cells come and then they eat or kill the bacteria or the foreign invader and then hopefully your body can heal, yeah? So the white blood cells, they do have a role. But Minister Inky says they're more like, they're not your immune system, they're more like your sanitary system because they go around cleaning things up. Now here's an x-ray of what they do. So you can see that they move kind of slimy, they're going after the bacteria or the foreign invader and they kind of engulf it and kill it. So that's what white blood cells are doing. Yeah. So they do have a place. So there's no getting away from inflammation. Anytime you damage yourself internally or externally, you're going to have inflammation. But there's two different types. There's chronic inflammation and acute inflammation. Acute inflammation is when you damage yourself and white blood cells come to the area, they do their job and then they leave. Yeah. So white blood cells come into the area, they, there's damage somewhere, they come and they clean up the damage or they get rid of the infection or the bacteria and then they leave and then your cells back to normal. However, chronic inflammation is when white blood cells come into the area and stay <laughs> and take over the area, literally take over the area. So they might come into a tissue or organ and take over the area and when they're killing bacteria and infections, they release these chemical um, like bullets that are called histamine. Now, anyone who knows about antihistamines, yeah, histamine is very irritating to the human body. So these white blood cells release histamine 
and it irritates the human body. So if you suffer from eczema or asthma or hay fever, any irritating sort of uh, symptoms like that, that's because white blood cells are releasing too much histamine, yeah? And the histamine damages the cell membrane wall. So then when the wall is damaged, your defense system is open, more things can come in, more white blood cells can come in and then they literally take over the area. Now again, I, I study history, again, big up Robin Walker, my black history teacher. So when I was studying this, I started to think to myself, wow, this looks kind of familiar. <laughs> <laughs> so you're telling me white blood cells come to an area and they say, hey, do you need any help? No, we're here to help. Do you need any help? Okay, let's, who, you, want, you want us to get rid of that, that person? Pow! Well, you want me, that person? Pow! Okay, cool. And then, they take over. <laughs> so in other words, they'll be like, okay, do you need, do you need any help in this, in this country? Yeah, we need that, get rid of that, get rid of that. Okay, we got rid of that person, get rid of that person. Okay, thanks, go away now. Uh, it's a nice country we've got here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? And then all of a sudden, they take over. I started to think, wait, are white blood cells colonizing? <laughs> That's what they do inside of your body. They colonize your tissues and organs. Now, how would you know if you're suffering from acute inflammation or chronic inflammation? Well, chronic inflammation is chronic, which means you're in pain. So, if you've been in pain or are in pain now, some of us have, you know, back pain, neck pain, ankle pain, understand that that's white blood cells colonizing an area. So, if you've got lower back pain and you've had it for years, that is colonized, that's the white blood cells colonizing that area. They've taken over. In other words, they're looking at the red blood cells like, get out of it. My area. Yep. How do you get rid of them? You've got to fight. <laughs> You've got to fight them. How do we... Yeah, we have to uncolonize. So, first of, all, first of all, we have to just have knowledge of self. So, we have to have knowledge of what's going on. Because again, going back to what I said at the beginning. Anything that is outside of your awareness is outside of your control. So. First, we need to build up our awareness. So this is what white blood cells do. They're linked to pretty much everything. So anytime you see itis at the end of something, that's inflammation. So now you know that's to do with white blood cells. So arthritis, any redness, swelling, muscle soreness, chronic bronchitis, all of the itises, they're to do with inflammation. Now, what conditions are linked to chronic inflammation? Inflammation is implicated in cardiovascular disease. Cancers cannot grow without inflammation. Autoimmune diseases are due to inflammation and joint pain. So they're all to do with chronic inflammation, yeah? Including fibroids. Fibroids starts off as inflammation. Now, I'm gonna show you a clip here. This is from The Breakfast Club. This lady here, she has a very powerful story with regards to fibroids, have you seen it? Very powerful story. Her name is Coach Jesse. Now, when I watched this, I was looking at these two brothers and I was thinking it was gonna be Americans. When you hear them speak, they're from the UK but they're doctors. So this is powerful what they're saying on The Breakfast Club. Listen to this. Her name is Coach Jesse. if you want to see the full clip, but listen to her story. Because of your battle, that yes. you've been very open about with fibroids. Yes. So explain what fibroids is. So sure, so fibroids are smooth muscle tumors that are usually benign and they, um, they actually are in and around the uterus. And sometimes they cause infertility. And me, as I said, I was one of those 90% of black women. And not only that, but my journey was crazy. It was a 14-year battle that included 10 surgeries, five of them alone just being for fibroids, um, five IVF cycles. Um, I had 10 years of infertility. I had a devastating miscarriage, 120-plus days in the hospital. And, um, and then uh, delivering my baby, my heart stopped on the delivery table. Wow. Nice. Yeah. But thank God, you know, thank God she's here. And I like to say that my baby, she actually birthed me into my mission because I didn't know it was like this crazy epidemic, right? But when she birthed me, when I birthed her, she birthed me into this work of being a nutrition health coach and of being an author of a book called Beyond Fibroids and then now doing this work with the, the doctors because um, after Essence Magazine profiled my story, it went viral because all these women were suffering, but suffering in silence. Because guess what? Huge number. Because your cousins, your sisters, your family, people who you know have been battling, but they don't talk to you about it. Okay? 
So in, in 2016, last January, we launched a program called the Hope Beyond Fibers Elimination Program. And, you know, we're actually coming up, what, now two years? Yeah. And we started just kind of looking at our case history, and we were seeing that not only were our clients living now five words free, one patient eliminated 50 five words without surgery. Mm -hmm. And for black women, they usually send us a history. Right. Yeah. Straight off the bat, okay? Which I think is a way of neutering us. And then on top of that, um, they were living cramp free. Mm -hmm. How many women you know can say that they're cramp free? I mean, mean y'all would like us to be cramp free. <laughs> Some people tell you, you, can, you don't have to get five words removed if it's not blocking you up there. Well, see, that's a lie. That's, a, that's lie. a lie. What they do is when you have small fibroids, they're going to say to you, let's just Don't monitor them. It. We're just going to monitor them, and then it gets to the point where now you need to go and spend some real money. Yeah. You know, um, it gets, the, the fibroids get big, they start messing with your kidneys, your liver, other organs. Because it's friendly you know, fire. Right. It's, I mean, it's an indicator because of the root cause. The root cause is estrogen dominance, which leads to other diseases such as diabetes, heart disease, cancer, which are all inflammatory diseases. So the fibroids are indicators that something's very wrong so, in your body. So when guys have fibroids, they got too much estrogen? Well, no, 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 no. Prostate, prostate cancer. Oh. Prostate cancer. Prostate cancer. Prostate cancer. Prostate cancer. All right, so they talked about estrogen do dominance. Estrogen, estrogen, same thing. So when it comes to estrogen or estrogen dominance, for women, you go through stages, yeah? So I know in the live stream they were talking about menopause and that sort of stuff. Again, our hormones are, rely our hormones are based on vitamin D and the sun and that sort of stuff. So if we're not getting vitamin D, it's gonna create a hormonal imbalance. And then on top of that, if we're eating high estrogen foods, it's gonna create a huge hormonal imbalance. But remember what I said, estrogen is a steroid hormone. So it helps to grow things, it helps to build things up. So estrogen during puberty helps to grow your body, woman. It helps to give you your shape, your lady parts. They grow because of estrogen, yeah? And it grows during um, pregnancy to help grow the fetus. So estrogen levels will be high during certain times of pregnancy to help grow the fetus. So estrogen is needed in your body because it's gonna help grow things. However, if you have an estrogen dominance, it's gonna help grow other things as well. So if you have a tiny tumor, that will grow. If you have a tiny fibroid, that will grow. If you have some tiny bacteria, that will grow because that's what estrogen does. It helps things to grow. So a estrogen dominance will lead to things growing in your body like a cancer cell or a tumor or a fibroid and that sort of stuff. So, and then, Obviously, estrogen is going to be high during your childbearing years and then start to lock off because the body's like, we don't need these instructions anymore. So that's when you start to go through the menopause. Now, menopause is just going through decades of hormonal imbalance and then the body not having estrogen and then all of a sudden it's, it's like a shock to the body. That's basically what menopause is. It's like the shock of going through all of this hormonal imbalance, yeah? But like I say, estrogen helps to grow things, especially during puberty and that sort of stuff. It gives you your shape. So black women, this is the reason why you have your shape is due to estrogen. Now, if this is true, then naturally, who would have the highest estrogen levels? Black women. Naturally would have higher estrogen levels. Now, if someone knew this, the easiest way then to get you sick is to feed you more estrogen because you already naturally have high estrogen levels. Why? Because of childbearing, yeah? So if you have naturally high estrogen levels, we give you more estrogen, it's gonna create a hormonal imbalance, you're gonna be sick. Now, if you don't believe me that this is our natural shape, who remembers this again, but going back to history? Who's this? Sarah Bartman, yeah? And so they've been studying you, black woman, for a very long time. Literally studying you, she was studied. They put her in a zoo. They put her in a zoo and allowed people to poke at her and pinch her and do all this sort of stuff. Again, don't believe a word I say. We've all got smartphones. Make your phone smart. Do some research on... There's a movie of her, yeah? So, but here's what's interesting. Look at her shape, yeah? And they were marveled by her shape to the point where they treated her like an animal, right? And then... The, she was sexually abused as well. I think she died at a very young age, like 20 years old from infection, from sexual diseases and that sort of stuff, yeah? So they used to ridicule her. Look at this. 
animal. Look at this person, yeah? And you know what's funny? Who's this? Kim Kardashian. How does she make her money? Imitating her. So she makes her money from imitating her. So how can we make sure that black women stay sick? Let's make sure that they have high estrogen. Naturally, they already have high estrogen levels. Let's make sure that everything around them has high estrogen as well. So what foods are high in estrogen? Most common foods found to be high in estrogen are wheat, including wheat products. So that's your bread and your pasta and all that sort of stuff. What else? Soy. That means your soybeans, your soy milk, your soy products. Soy <laughs> is just high in estrogen. So all the people that think, oh yeah, no, I'm healthy, no, I'm vegan. Most of the vegan products are made from soy. So that's why sometimes I don't like, people ask me, am I a vegan? I'm like, I'm not a vegan. Because there's confusion there. A vegan will think that they're healthy and they're eating a lot of soy products. It's high in estrogen, yeah? Meat and dairy. Don't get angry with me. Science, not according to Leo Marshall, according to science. Meat and dairy is high in estrogen. Why? Well, because the animals, they have estrogen. So, and then they're going to inject them with more to make sure that everyone has a hormonal imbalance. Alcohol, alcohol, hmm. Tap and bottled water, tap and bottled water as well. All these, these all act as endocrine disruptors. Now, Sal, who was talking about the hair, she talked about endocrine disruptors being in hair products. So it's not just in hair products, it's in food as well, yeah? And for the people who, you know, they think they're healthy just having vegan burgers and all this sort of stuff, which is the, all the craze now, check this out. This is the Impossible Whopper, yeah? Now this is in America. Now look who they're trying to target. Look who they're targeting, for those who have their eyes open. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll cheer them, yeah? <laughs> look who they're trying to target with this Impossible Whopper, which is a vegan burger, yeah? And check this out, Doctor, Burger King's Impossible Burger has 18 million times more estrogen than regular Whopper. So all of these, and it's happening over here as well, I think McDonald's have one, Burger King, KFC, they all have these vegan burgers now. Estrogen burgers, that's what you're eating, estrogen burgers, yeah? And it's not just estrogen, it's xenoestrogen as well. This is synthetic estrogen that, again, Sal talked about in your hair products, um, in pesticides, tap water, canned foods, plastics, yeah? And beauty products. Again, don't get angry with me, this is science, yeah? Beauty products are high in estrogen. So if you're using a lot of makeup, that's another way of them getting estrogen in your body, yeah? All of your beauty products that you're using, high in estrogen. And again, it's the estrogen that leads to your fibroids. The high estrogen leads to the, the tiny fibroid growing to be as big as a grapefruit or even bigger like a watermelon or something like that. Yeah. So going back to the doctors, listen to what they say about um, estrogen here. And they talk about the contraceptive pill as well. Listen to this. Cycle. They'll put young girls onto the um, contraceptive pill. To regulate. to regulate this yes, cycle. They'll right. say, you know, some girl, and this is the thing, a lot of black girls are like athletes. You might be in the cheerleader or whatever. Mm -hmm. when, you're, when you are, when, when women are at the athletic, you know, op optimum of uh, um, athleticism, they don't bleed. You ain't gonna bleed. Really? Once, yeah. Women are not supposed to bleed. You're not supposed to menstruate. Yeah, I'm hearing this. Right? Like, you're not supposed to have a head. It's because of it's because of the it's because of estrogen. Why women bleed how they bleed? They're not supposed to bleed. Medically, we're supposed to bleed only like three tablespoons. Now, do you even know a woman? Not even that. It's like spotting. Unless you're on, unless you're on the right. Because she's always pregnant. Unless you're on the pill. Now she's going to be pregnant, but before that, she really <laughs> bleeds, she doesn't get cramped, oh, she doesn't right. get That's it. good. Right. That's, That's right. supposed to be. Now, this is the thing. So when, so when girls are not bleeding regularly, something, oh, something's got to be wrong. So, because something's wrong, let's give you the estrogen pill. Because yeah. the contraceptive pill is estrogen. Mm -hmm. So when you take the estrogen pill, now you've got estrogen flowing through your blood and it starts affecting organs. Now, estrogen is a DNA disruptor. Now, here's the deal. Because we've been taught that estrogen is the female hormone. So it's understand what he's saying hormone. right now is estrogen is not the natural female hormone. It's actually... Oh, progesterone. It, right. You're blowing my mind, bro. Right. You're blowing my mind That's right That's a big now. deal right here. So, so this is the thing. So, estrogen is free flowing around the body, mm -hmm. right? And it disrupts the endocrine. It's an endocrine disruptor, it's a cellular disruptor. 
it, it slows down the mitochondria. Mitochondria in a cell, I don't want to get too technical, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. right? Don't get the science the Mitochondria now. is the engine and the life, it's, it's the vibrancy of the cell. So, so, when your, so when your mitochondria is operating at its best, you don't get sick. Mm. You will not get sick, it keeps your cell pure or charged. So when the estrogen hits the cell, it diffuses into the cell cellular membrane and gets into the mitochondria, slows it down. When it slows it down, now your cell is not charged. Now white blood cells see the cell as foreign. Mm -hmm. So white blood cells now start attacking. attacking, shooting out all kinds of chemicals, and then that's how fibroids are formed. It's the, it's the fight between gotcha. the and tumor, It's not cells. just fibroids, it's all kind of tumor. All, Again, all it's inflammatory tumors. diseases. Yeah, yeah. Right. All kinds of so what I was saying. So I'm hoping people are starting to put two and two together. So white blood cells have a, a role because they lead to chronic inflammation and then it's the inflammation which might be small and then the estrogen helps that to grow. Yeah? And black women you naturally have high estrogen levels, hence your shape, and hence the fact that you can you've got wider hips for childbearing activities and that sort of stuff. But if someone knew this, then they'd know how to disrupt your hormones. Just give you more estrogen. Yeah? Alright, now. I'm showing you exactly where I'm getting my research from, so you can do your own research. But this is from the US Department of Health and Human Services. Now it says, what are the risk factors for uterine fibroids? So this is America. What are the risk factors for uterine fibroids? So let's see what they say. It says, fibroids usually grow in women of childbearing age, and research suggests that they may shrink after menopause, because the body gets rid of the estrogen, the estrogen is not needed anymore, yeah? However, research also shows that they are more likely to shrink in postmenopausal white women than in postmenopausal black women. Why? For African American women, fibroids typically develop at a younger age, grow larger, and cause more severe symptoms. Again, why? Several factors may affect a woman's risk for having uterine fibroids, including the following age, older women at a higher risk than younger women. Interesting, age. Then African-American race. Now this was in America, so they went with African-American race, but now we're seeing it all over the world. So it's not African-American race, it's just black women, yeah? So black women, for some reason, is a risk factor. Obesity, family history, high blood pressure, no history of pregnancy. No history of pregnancy. That's because the estrogen in your body is used for a purpose, to grow the fetus, to grow other things, but to grow the fetus. So if you have no history of pregnancy, that's confusing for your body. So that could lead to fibroids. If that weren't a message from your creator, that you need to, the reason why you should be on this planet, like to reproduce. If you don't, you get sick. Vitamin D deficiency, because according to me, vitamin D is your immune system. So if you're deficient in this, you'll start to suffer from that. Food additives and then soy as well. And then it says, um, other factors that lower the risk. Now, you can't just go by one source, so here's another source. This is Mayo Clinic, and Mayo Clinic had a Q&A, risk factors for uterine fibroids. So let's go through their Q&A. So the question was, dear Mayo Clinic, my mother and my sister were treated for uterine fibroids in their late 30s, I just turned 35, and I'm starting to worry that I'll get them too. Am I at risk for fibroids because I have a family history of them, or are there other things that raise my risk? What symptoms should I look for, watch out for? Answer, heredity can play a role in your risk for developing uterine fibroids, your age, your race, when you started having periods and a number of other factors. And they go on to say, race is a risk factor for uterine fibroids as well. So they say here, uh, one of the risk factors, family history, age, Uterine fibroids don't occur in girls before puberty, nor do they develop in women after they have gone through menopause, because again, the estrogen is not being produced anymore, yeah? These fibroids are most often diagnosed in women in their 30s and 40s. So they say race is a risk factor, and then, what do the experts say? Although the reasons for it are not clear, black women are more likely to have fibroids than white, or than other, any other woman, yeah? So again, the experts are saying they're not sure. They go on to say other factors include when your menstrual cycle be began, obesity, vitamin D deficiency, drinking alcohol, because that's estrogen, diet high in red meat. All right, 
And then it says there are factors that can lower your risk for fibroids too. For example, research suggests that women who use oral or injectable contraceptives are less likely to, uh, to get uterine fibroids. Don't believe a word they say though, do your own research. Then, then, then those who don't. And the risk continues to decrease long, the longer the contra contraceptives are used. Again, don't believe a word they say, do your own research. But check this out, pregnancy also seems to have a protective effect. So again, if you're using your body for what you're supposed to be using it for, you're, you'll be healthy. The risk of uterine fibroids goes down with each full-term pregnancy. Now, according to the evidence, black women, you don't have a problem getting pregnant or delivering a baby, according to the evidence. However, according to the evidence, other people do. Now, what would that be down to? Now you know the science behind it. Let me show you what happens inside of your body you know, when you're trying to get pregnant. Sperm are foreign to a woman's body and are treated as unwanted invaders. Her immune system is triggered to kill them. Once they enter the cervix, they are in a labyrinth of dead ends. Perfect for an ambush. White blood cells attack the sperm from all directions. white blood cells, but that's what they do, they attack a foreign invaders and that sort of stuff. So that can lead to infertility. If you have too many white blood cells doing that, it can lead to infer infertility. Now I got this clip from this site here, well this was on Twitter, they're called Medical Shots. Now listen to how they explain the video. Immune system attacking men's sperms inside women bodies leading to infertility. Amazing video. What? <laughs> What's amazing about infertility? Now, if you do your research, again, don't believe a word I say, do your own research. If you do your research, you'll actually find that um, white people generally have higher white blood cell count. And black people generally, especially African people, have generally low. So this was taken from, if you want to take a picture of it, Bain um, et al. So this was uh, an experiment from 1996. So what does table three show? It shows Caucasian, African, Afro-Caribbean, and Jamaican. And just look at that top, men. White blood cell count, WBC count. Who's got the highest? Caucasian, 5.7. Who's got the lowest? African, 4.5. So naturally, African people have a lower white blood cell count. Why? Because according to me, white blood cells are not your immune system. Vitamin D is. So if you're out in Africa, if you're out in the sun, you don't need white blood cells. You need more vitamin D. However, if you're not, and you're from a different climate, climate, you might need more white blood cells, yeah? So naturally, Caucasians have higher white blood cells, which could, in them, lead to fertility. According to who? Well, according to the evidence. This came out last year. USA Today, why the US birth rate hitting a 32-year low could become a big problem. Now, this came out in May, um, May 2019, but you know it's actually the same over here. So people are having problems um, with fertility over here. Now, here's where, why you have to understand language. When it comes to science, I feel like if you understand the language, you'll really understand what people are actually saying when they're talking. So if you just read through this, I've underlined a few things, but it says, the birth rate in the US hit a 32 year low last year as the number of babies born dropped for the fourth straight year, federal health officials said in a report. Then it goes on to say, the total fertility rate in the US dropped 2% since last year and hit a record low of 1.7 births per woman. Meaning, not enough babies are being born to replace the current population levels. Someone translate that for me. <laughs> not enough white babies are being born. <laughs> the total fertility rate in 2018 they talk about total fertility rate, and then they say having fertility rates lower than replacement levels means that the country's population could become unbalanced. Again, someone, someone translate that for me. They're now 
They used to be 3%, they're 4%. No, <laughs> we can't have this, yeah? And then that's what the experts say, yeah? And then they said, what are the reasons for this? Climate effect, more women say climate change means they won't have kids, and then the experts are saying couples are having less sex, okay? <laughs> they're just trying to explain this, yeah? Now, when this came out, again, May, May 2019, when this came out, laws changed straight away in the US. Look at this, Alabama just passed a near total ban of abortion, no exceptions for rape or incest. Doctors could face 99 years in prison for providing abortions. And then this woman says, it's a war on women. <laughs> it's a war on women and it's time to fight like hell. All right. And other people started to go with this. So look at this, this guy from Twitter said, 22 senators voted against including an exception for rape or incest in Alabama's new draconian abortion law. And these are the people that said, hey, listen, I don't yeah. care how you got yeah. pregnant, you've got to have that baby. Yeah? Because we don't want the population to become, you know, in balance. They're at 3%, how dare them get to 4%? Yeah? Look at this, again, this is America, passed new abortion limits in 2019. So these are the, the states that have passed this abortion limit. In other words, you can't have an abortion even if you were raped or whatever. Yeah? So how many is that? One, two, eight. Eight states in America. That was 2019. What's that going to look like by 2020 or 2021 or 2022? Yeah. And again, people will say, well, that's America. You know, in America, it's blatant. Well, over here, actually, if it was over here, you tell me. Because again, in America, the state of the war is obvious. If over here we had an issue with race, yeah, what area of the UK would have the highest abortion rate? London. London. More abortions carried out in London than anywhere else in England. Yeah, so this was from 2016. 2016, and it says, abortion rates are higher in the capital than anywhere else in England. London boroughs comprise nine of the top 10. And if you want to know the boroughs, they're there. So, oh, some of your boroughs might be in there. <laughs> yes, some of your boroughs are in there. So, again, we like to play the I don't see game over here, but evidence is clear. Now, why is this happening? Why is there so many abortions in that area? Yes, bro. This one. So why is, why is this happening? Why in London then? Why is this happening? All right, so check this out. This is from 2009, so sometimes you have to go back to do your research. New baby boom. Britain is experiencing a population spike. Why? Uh, we visit Boston and all of these areas to see where they have the, the highest average birth rate, yeah? Now, why is the reason? Why did they have a high birth rate in 2009 or a high baby boom? This, from this article, they say it was undoubtedly the biggest factor in the present boom is immigration. Hmm. So more babies were being born in the UK in 2009 and it was due to immigration. Now, they went on to talk about um, the immigrants and how fertile they were. So look at this. So here are the immigrants. They didn't put Africa in there, but here are the immigrants. And look how fertile they are. They're the ones having the most babies. Caribbean countries, we're up there. So we were the most fertile, yeah? But I didn't have Africa in there, so I had to do some research. This was from uh, 1989 to 2008. I had to do some research. What about Africa? Well, if you go to our world in data, it shows you um, children born per woman. So it shows you who the most fertile are, from least fertile to mo most fertile. And surprise, surprise, who's the most fertile women? African women, yeah? You're the most fertile. Not only are you the most fertile women on the planet, according to the evidence, not according to me, but you have cells that can replicate outside of your body. And that was proved with this woman, Henrietta Lacks. So the black history that's not taught in schools. Now, if you don't know who this woman is, check this story out, Henrietta Lacks. Over the past six decades, huge medical advances have sprung from the cells of Henrietta Lacks, a poor African-American mother of five who died in 1951 of cervical cancer. Yeah? But Lax never agreed that her cells from a biopsy before her death taken um, could be used for research. So she died and they took her cells without telling her or her family. Yeah? For years, her own family had no idea that her cells were still alive in petri dishes in scientist labs. Still alive today. She died in 1951. Yeah? They eventually learned that they had fueled a line called HeLa cells or HeLa cells 
which have generated billions of dollars, but they didn't realize until this spring that her genome had been sequenced and made public for anyone to see. So her, her family didn't even know that her cells were still alive, let alone that they were making money for the medical industry. Yeah? So in, in the years since her death, black cells taken from her tumor while she was undergoing surgery have been responsible for some of the most important medical advances of all time. Polio vaccine, chemotherapy, cloning, gene mapping, IVF. All of these health master milestones and many more owe everything to the life and death of this young mother. Now it says here, scientists at the hospital where she died, John Hopkins, had been working for years to try to start a continuously reproducing line, but the cells always died. Again, who can translate that? What cells were they using? Right. Lacks were the first that took introducing a constantly reproducing line of cells that are literally, to give them their scientific definition, immortal. Her cells are still alive today. Then it says, ordinary cells taken from a human body and kept in a lab have a limited lifespan. Ordinary. Again, translate. <laughs> However, an immortal cell line is cultured in a particular way so it has the ability to proliferate indefinitely. And that's what Henrietta, Henrietta Lacks' cells do. So listen to this. It's still a little bit of a mystery. To this day, HeLa cells, named by combining the first two letters of Henrietta with the first two of Lacks, are a cornerstone of modern medicine. Tick off for me all the ways HeLa cells have been used. <laughs> to tick off all the way HeLa cells have been used, we'll be sitting here for weeks. <laughs> you know, like hundreds and thousands of, of studies. They used to help test the polio vaccine so that it could be approved for use in people. Um, they went up in the first space missions to see what would happen to human cells in zero gravity. Those were the first cells ever cloned, some of the first genes ever mapped. And then listen to the fact that the family only found out a couple years ago. So if they are making billions of dollars from your mother. Shouldn't you get at least a couple million? To calculate how much money has been made off of Henrietta Lacks' cells? I know. I mean, they were the first cells ever commercialized. Um, and that was in the 50s. And you can buy online heal cells or products made using heal cells from anywhere from about $200 for a vial up to about $10,000 a vial. Heal cells are still, you know, one of the most widely used cells in the world, so... But it's, it's an incalculable amount of money. Yeah. Is it? And consider this. The family of the woman whose cells changed medical history can't afford health insurance. Henrietta's middle child, Sonny, is a hundred thousand dollars in debt after bypass surgery. How does that leave you feeling? Oh, it, it leaves me feeling kind of not angry a little bit that I don't have the medical coverage and then that my mother's cells being used all over the world for science purpose and then the medical coverage that we have is zero. Me and my... Look at that. So, they're using this black woman's cells and they're immortal. And they're using it to cure diseases, cancer, create medication from it, and all this sort of stuff, and the family gets nothing. Yeah. Now, every time I show this story to people, people always say, what was so special about Henrietta Lacks? And you know what my response is? Nothing. She was a black woman. In other words, there's some Henrietta Lacks in here right now. But you don't know. Yes, sis. Smears, Anything. blood transfusions, stem cells, all that sort of stuff. Yes, DNA testing, DNA testing. From when they get your blood, yeah, from when they get your blood, yeah. Yes, sis, I see you putting up your hand. Yes, yes, sis. Well, again, if you go by my opinion, which they were, uh, my opinion is there's nothing special about Henrietta Lacks. In other words, I'm looking at a lot of Henrietta Lacks now. If you go by that, when you go and do a DNA test, you're literally giving them what they want. <laughs> give me your genes, give me your blood, give me this, yeah? You're literally giving them what they want. Don't forget yeah? they do the, the, the cord test for new babies as yep. well. There you go. So any which way they can get your cells, tissues and organs, because again, you are the original. Yes, this at the back. Ah, I'm about to go on to that. Yeah, we're going to go on to that. That's, to be fair, do you want me to go into that? Do you really want me to go into that? 
Listen, that's all to do with this stuff, stem cells. So what is a stem cell? A stem cell can be any one of the 220 different cells in the body. A stem cell can be convert. Well, the way I use the analogy is a stem cell is like you're a baby uh, or a child who doesn't know what it wants to be when it grows up. So if you nurture that child and you train it to be a lawyer, it's going to grow up to be a lawyer or it's going to grow up to be whatever you want it to be. That's what your stem cells are. Stem cells are cells that haven't decided what type of cells they're going to be yet. So they might grow into a kidney cell, they might grow into a liver cell or a heart cell or a lung cell. So if you can get people's stem cells, you can le literally recreate the person. Because the stem cells are like the babies, yeah? So you get the stem cells and it, it can be converted into whatever you want to convert it to, yeah? So a stem cell is a primitive cell with the ability to, look what stem cells can do. Reduce inflammation, fight cell death, can differentiate in, um, into different tissues, muscle, bone, fat, cartilage, and it can self-replicate. Now, when I saw this, I was like, self-replicate? You mean clone itself? Well, the only evidence of cells being able to do that is Henrietta Lacks' cells. So in other words, every time you hear the word stem cell, understand who they're talking about. You. Stem cell research, stem cell therapy, they're talking about you. Now, why is that important? Well, stem cell research and therapy is very, very expensive. Look at this. Who's this? Tony Robbins. I got this from his Facebook. Look what he says. Feeling absolutely invigorated after our trip to Panama this weekend where I received the transformative benefits of stem cell therapy. Yeah. So he says stem cells saved my shoulder after struggling with excruciating pain from spinal stenosis. He starts talking about it. Now he said he went to this state of the art stem cell institute. How much do you reckon he paid to get there and to do this therapy? Remember, he's a billionaire. Yeah. So they're using, according to the evidence, your cells to cure other people's diseases. Yeah. Now look at this. He says the journey begins. I've been a huge beneficiary of stem cells as one of Cellularity Inc's first patients. And he starts to talk about cellularity. So me being um, quite inquisitive, I was like, who are these cellularity people? So I started to do my research on them. They're the ones that are doing a lot of this stem cell research. Now listen to their words when they're talking about stem cells. Oh, before I show you that, this was on his site and he was saying how great stem cells are, how they do this and they reverse diseases and that sort of stuff. Then people in his comments started to ask the obvious question. Where are you getting the stem cells from? Check this out. This person says, do you know where the stem cells come from? Silence. Where do the stem cells come from? Silence. And then this person says, I am all for the research as long as it doesn't use hum human embryos. Silence, yeah? So this is cellularity. Listen to what they say. And be able to intervene before disease occurs. Tell us about cellularity, Peter. So, I mean, cellularity really builds on the 20 years of amazing work that Bob has done uh, as a rock star in this industry and the 120 scientists, engineers that he has. But it's built on Bob's earliest discoveries that the placenta is the richest store, uh, source of stem cells that can help you know, augment your longevity and your immunity. And uh, the vision here is really how do we have a healthier, longer life and how do we use these stem cells and immunological cells to help fight cancers. So, so you're looking at living cells, turning them into medicine. That's exactly right. I mean, our mission has been to turn cells that are recovered from the postpartum placenta, the richest source of stem, progenitor, and immune cells we know of, into true medicines that can be deployed to treat cancer, autoimmune diseases and degenerative diseases. How does it work? Because, I mean, somebody said earlier, oh, this makes 100 years old the new 60. Well, you know, that's, <laughs> that's, 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 that's a big... Whoever gets your stem cells can then use your stem cells to regenerate themselves. All right, now listen to what they say in this clip. Again, the cellularity guys, listen to this part. And so, so one of my one business, business partners, partners, my co-founder of Human Longevity uh, and my partner in founding Cellularity, Bob Hariri, Bob's an MD, PhD, a Navy fighter pilot, one of the rock stars in the stem cell world, has actually done the work to show if you take, um, in this case he did the work in, in mice, you take the placentas of that mice, you convert it to dosages of stem cells that you then give to that mouse at the end of its life, like in this case, typically a 26-month-old mouse, you will extend that mouse life another 30 to 40 percent. Whoa. Right? You'll add another year almost onto it. And 
that's been repeated in a number of different ways. There's a whole thing called the Young Blood experiments being done at Stanford. Uh, and right now, the experiments are going on in humans as well. That if, you know, it's sort of like uh, <laughs> sort of Dracula and the vampire, but if you take the blood of a young individual and transfuse it, or the plasma, uh, not the cellular portion, right. into an older person, you will get a lot of return to youthful state. And in reality, um, it turns out that uh, there are a number of stem cell clinics outside the United States. And I happen to know a number of 80-something-year-old billionaires who go mm -hmm. and don't get young blood infusion, but get stem cell infusions. Why not young blood? Well, it turns out that the stem cells actually generate the, um, uh, the growth factors and all the chemical milieu that is in the plasma, and they live for 100 days. Now, is it stem cells from themselves? No, it's stem cells from newborns. Really? It's the stem cells from the placentas or the cord blood that are typically thrown away. Oh. That is utterly fascinating. I could do an entire show just picking your brain about that. Fascinating. <laughs> wow. So, where are they getting these stem cells from? You. Throwing away your placenta, always donating blood and all this sort of stuff. You don't even understand how powerful your genes are. And they said that they get young blood as well and inject it into billionaires and all that. And that's actually a thing. Look at this, young blood elixir that prevents age-related diseases. Look, the super rich are injecting blood from teenagers to gain immortality. This is actually a thing, yeah? And the easiest, we're finishing up now, last three minutes. The easiest way to hide the truth is to hide it where? In plain sight. They like to put the truth in movies, TV shows, and adverts. So again, if you've got your third eye open, you'll see certain things. I don't know if anyone saw, especially when you watch these vampire TV shows, there's a vampire TV show called The Passage. Now just watch the trailer for this TV show. We represent a government medical organization called Project NOAA. We're on the verge of an exciting breakthrough, a drug that makes people immune to disease. What does this have to do with me? We're offering you a second chance. You have the opportunity to take part in a drug trial. I know what I'd do. You ever wonder what happens to these homicidal maniacs once they get in that elevator? I don't think about it. We're looking at a global pandemic. You get exposed at breakfast, you're dead by dinner. I got something. Nobody's gonna like it though. Yeah, well, I have a very open mind right now. Patient zero. After a short period of accelerated healing, he declined into this. He's immune to disease, lethal and ugly as hell. But we're still making progress. It's not just tweaks to the formula. It's age. Are you suggesting we try with a child? No. A child would come through with zero side effects. You wanted a solution. This is it. How feasible is it to find a child? It's just a matter of finding a kid with no family. The CDC wants you to see a specialist in Colorado. How come there's no social worker? And how come they didn't send a lady? They always send a lady. They just sent us. Can you live with this? This either I live with it or millions of people die. Just making a break for it. Come on! Just making a break for it. Come on! It's called The Passage. It's called The Passage. And in it, it's about vampires, but if you get bitten, you're dead infected. And guess who has the antidote? The young black girl. The young black girl has the antidote. And you hear what she said, they said, they said, find someone who doesn't have a family. The young black girl, yeah? She's the antidote, she's the cure, right? But this vampire thing, they've been running with it for a very long time. When I speak about vampires, people think, oh, you're talking science fiction. No, this is an actual real thing. 
people are starting to do something called vampire facials. Look at this. Bloody hell, what is a vampire facial? Extreme anti-aging treatment loved by celebs such as Kim Kardashian and some other white women. The, ce <laughs> the celeb-endorsed anti-aging treatment costs around several hundred. So it's, it's, it's expensive to do this vampire facial stuff. Now, anyone who's a little bit squeamish, warning, I'm going to show you a picture. You might want to look away right, right now. But this is what a vampire facial looks like. If you want to reverse the aging process, you could give smothering yourself in blood a try. Now, what blood are you smothering yourself in? Crazy. Now, apparently, because a lot of the Kardashians have done it, apparently they use their own blood, which don't make sense, but they use their own blood. But, because it's either their own blood or someone else's. And if it's someone else's, it can only be what blood type? Oh, oh so whose blood have you got in your face? I wonder. This is crazy. Now, now, Kim Kardashian, because she's such an influencer, if she starts to do something, people run with it. So, people are starting to do this vampire facial thing, yeah, because they're following what Kim Kardashian is doing. And let's just remind ourselves where Kim Kardashian comes from. She comes from this family who have made a lot of money. Kim Kardashian makes the most, 350 million, but the whole family makes lots of money. Remember, she makes her money imitating a black woman, yeah? That's how she makes her money, and she's worth 350 million imitating you. Yeah? So she makes 350, she makes the most, but there's others. Hold on a second. Wait, she doesn't make the most. Who makes the most? Kylie. Kylie makes the most. One billion dollars. Well, how do, why does she make so much money? Because she makes her money imitating you. She makes her money imitating a black woman as well. So she's worth one billion, and they're making billions off of Hen Henrietta Lacks' cells up to this day, imitating you. So let's just recap. Black women, you are the most fertile women on the planet, according to who? According to Leo Marshall? No, according to the evidence. You have the most sought after features in the world. Yeah? Everyone wants your lips. Everyone wants your melanin. Everyone wants your shape, your bum. According to who? Leo Marshall? No, according to the evidence. Yeah? Your shape is the way it is for childbearing. You have wider hips, you have higher estrogen levels. Yeah? You could argue you should be doing two things. Your shape is for two reasons. One, to attract a mate, and two, to have children. And what's crazy is if you don't, you'll get sick. I just showed you the evidence. If you don't do that, you'll get fibroids. So, what else? Oh, you have the original blood type that can be donated to everyone. And you have stem cells that can be used to literally reverse and treat nearly every disease that's out there, including reverse aging. Hmm. Now, if we lived in a society that knew all of this, yeah, and you know, they wanted to ensure that people who don't have your genetics continue to receive your very unique blood your unique stem cells, your unique tissues and organs, what would the powers that be in that society do? I'm not sure. I'm not sure what they do. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure what they do. Science is simple. Science is simple. It's just that you've been taught it in a confusing way. And there's only one of two reasons why. Either the person teaching you science didn't understand the subject well enough. Or they did. They just didn't want you to understand it. I'm going to let you put two and two together on that one. My name is Neil Marshall, and that concludes the end.
five minutes. Did you all have a good time? Yeah.